Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, today we have uh, Dr. Bennett as our last presenter in this semester of semiotics course. Some of you already uh, know him. Before transferring to Alamut, Dr. Bennett used to teach semiotics and methodology class at the Tartu University, Department of Semiotics. So it's to our best benefit to have him here, at least in this last lecture of the semester. And um, his um, specialization is in uh, structural semiology and uh, second generation semiology, theoretical, but also applied to psychoanalysis, for example. And he's also um, very actively involved in the biosemiotics group. And today he will present um, some small sample of his very recent uh, project. So enjoy. It's actually been a few years since I could teach. I taught for many years in Tartu. Then I had to stop for, for a few years, mostly to finish my dissertation. And that was terrible. Maybe shut the door. Or it was hard for me because teaching had become a big part of my identity. It happens. Uh, anyway, so this is the first time actually teaching or being uh, lecturing in a course. I'll, I haven't actually started teaching. I'll start teaching next semester as we'll talk. But first time teaching a course in three and a half years or something. So I'd just like to express my gratitude to you and. Um, uh, I guess I could also confess I'm a little nervous because if things go well, if my plans go well, I'll be teaching, well, not you specifically necessarily, but students here anyway for, for many years to come. And so it's a moment to stay uh, for me anyway. So anyway, uh, hope it comes off well. I received your responses. Uh, surprisingly, a vast number of responses. And I printed them here. And it shouldn't surprise me that everyone, except one, uh, chose question number one because the answer was, it seems like the easiest answer, but well, we'll discuss it at the end because the first part of the talk, or of the day, I guess, will be my lecture. And, but I'm trying to cut it off in 45 minutes so that we have a full uh, half an hour to discuss your questions and your responses. And then there'll be 15 minutes at the end for uh, me to talk about the course I'm giving next semester and then perhaps for Ludmila also to talk to you briefly about maybe your examinations or whatever else uh, logistical matters you have to cover for your course to wrap up the course, wrap up the semester, and so on. I know the course has been very introductory and not all of you are semiotic students. When I taught in Tartu, everyone there was a master's student and it was a master's program of semiotics. And so everyone there, you could presume at least everyone there, had some kind of either, well, either formal training in semiotics or at least a definite interest in semiotics. I'm with you guys. It's not necessarily the case. And I already got in trouble in Tartu for my courses being too complicated. Or there were complaints, usually in the early days, first weeks of class, students would go to the administration and say, we don't know what the hell Tyler's talking about. And so going into this, I thought that I might try to simplify it, but then I thought, no, 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 no. That's not how I approach things. You've already had a bit of introduction. You've gotten some of the basics. Uh, the Persian sign trichotomy, icon index symbol, example, and you got the Saucerian dichotomy of you know, the signifier and signified, and maybe the Jacobsonian uh, communication model, the sender receiver, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, of course, these minimal basics are a requirement to go into it. However, I have always stood by the contention that, to quote my former supervisor, uh, semiotics has no beginning, and that uh, it doesn't really work to try to start from the beginning, or to take a historical approach even. Start from A, then go to B, to C, trying to put it together, or to construct a rational framework to comprehend semiotics. Rather, I think it's better to take a student and sort of drop them in the middle of the most complicated uh, the labyrinth, if you will, of semiotic thought. And for them to have to grasp on, because in my lecture you may not, I mean, you'll probably hear one or two things that make sense to click, click to you, and you must grasp onto these things. And follow them like a thread, 
out to the perimeter of the maze, if you will. Uh, and and from, from there, you may develop a passion which can further direct your studies if you choose to continue with semiotics. But, so for that reason, if you become baffled during the talk, it's not your fault. Yes? Okay. Now the title of the talk is Semiology Anticipates the Paradigm Shift. This nice animation. And it's a talk, actually I wrote the talk for Vít Gvozdiak's course at the Bohemian University, Western Bohemian University, and I gave it to his group two weeks ago. But I've had time to adapt it, because as you may recall, I was planning to give this talk for you guys, but then we had to cancel it because there was some holiday, right? That was for this course, right? Yes. I changed it somewhat. It doesn't really matter. Initially, it consisted of two parts. The first part dealing with semiology, we can call it this uh, radicalized and also pessimistic or solipsistic semiology, semiology from the 60s in Paris. And I, I created this little, or I added this little icon to indicate its pessimism regarding the, the paradigm shift. Uh, and then the second part was uh, to flip it around uh, to moderate that pessimism and to remind the listeners that semiology isn't purely solipsistic or nihilistic, if you will. It's not purely critical or deconstructive. There are also practical applications, positive applications. And I created this little icon for that. But this time, actually, I got rid of the positive stuff. I'm only going to talk about the negativity for you because I think that it's probably, well, you know, I don't know. Your other lecturers are going to give you a different spin. Uh, but from my view, if you come to semiotics asking a question like, how am I going to use this to further my career, for example, then you're probably entering it for the wrong reasons. And instead of trying to adapt semiotics to, to these instrumental ends, I guess, career building or, I don't know, giving me an edge in marketing and advertising or uh, whatever you like. Uh, Instead of that, we should instead emphasize the, the, the other side of semiotics, which is its critical nature. And then, if you can wrap your mind around the actual nature of early semiology, radical semiology, later, indeed, you may, you may discover that it does. Like, you can use those insights, and you can actually take advantage in the marketplace or wherever you like. But it's crucial at the beginning for you to not think about it in that way. How am I going to apply this to, to what? Uh, and so that's why, that's why I start with semiology. Not because it's all that's there. And with regard to the paradigm shift, uh, there can be no argument that we're living through a paradigm shift and, and that it has something to do with information technology. Uh, that's the idea of the presentation. And there can be no argument that semiology anticipated this shift somehow. Not just a broader epistemological shift, but also the fact that it manifests at the level of technology, specifically communication technology. But the question for us, though, the question is what should it be our orientation to this shift? Should it be one of radical resistance? Or is, is the, are the technologies of communication and information surely an embodiment of this like technological matrix which we've been fighting forever, should it be resisted? Or rather, do the tools of information and communication technology give us the means of emancipation from this matrix? And so, broadly speaking, from the pessimistic viewpoint of semiology, it is the former. There's nothing worse than social media it reflects back to us all of the worst things about our human nature, you know, vanity and tendency for distraction and so on. And we should do everything we can to, I don't know, break away from it or even to smash it, if you will. But, and you can easily read semiology in that way, in the pessimistic way. But the conclusion of the presentation will maintain that it can be read in uh, numerous lights and actually it's our responsibility to read it in, in the latter light. Rather which would read the paradigm shift to life online, if you will, as sort of the flowering of a whole new uh, era of like post-logocentric plenitude and 
return to the body and freedom from old structures of patriarchy and domination and so on and so on and so on. And classically, this is what semiotics is really all about, actually. It's identifying, let's see, sort of uh, the framework of this logocentric patriarchal matrix and teaching people how to resist it, to destroy it effectively. Unless you understand that and accept it about semiotics, then there's no, there's no going forward. But, so I'll come back to this, this two-sided orientation to the paradigm shift. But the paradigm shift itself is difficult to define, and rather instead we can start with defining semiology, which is a project I put a lot of time into in my dissertation. My dissertation, which is here, which took forever. I, it took me eight years to write this. And also, it covers a lot of material. Uh, and uh, opening thrust was to defend this widely discredited uh, branch of semiotics that is French semiology. And it's discredited on a number of different counts. It's pessimism its solipsism, its affiliation with leftist politics, radical leftist politics, etc. Uh, but I view it as crucial to the entire picture. Uh, so semiology comprises the, I guess, this coordinate. There are five chapters in the dissertation, and the first chapter is about semiology. Focusing specifically on first Saussure and Helmslow, Roland Barth, and uh, Jacques Derrida, a large section on Jacques Derrida. And today's talk is going to emphasize, it's going gonna, it's gonna to remain with this coordinate. But semiology has a sort of indelible bond, or sort of what can't be erased anyway. Many have had tried to, to erase or to sanitize the semiotics, to remove, either to remove this coordinate entirely of semiology and deconstruction, or to erase its bond with Marxist ideology critique, for example, uh, commodity fetishism and so on, and theory of value. Also to erase it, the bond with psychoanalysis, which I'll talk, I'll talk a little about that too, but the bond is so strong between these two that they can't really even be separated. Because Lacan and Kristeva are also semiologists, they're not just psychoanalysts. And, uh, well, these will be left aside almost entirely. We won't talk about them, unless with regard to the question I gave you. But ultimately, the goal, as I said, as I mentioned, there being two, <coughs> two sides, the pessimistic approach is not sufficient to answer the problem of the paradigm shift. The ultimate goal is to actually unify it with this sort of more scientific. Uh, positivistic or instrumentalizable approach to semiotics, which you've learned about probably a bit more from Dan and from Claudio, this Persian semiotics, which tends to blend with cognitive science and have all sorts of applications in marketing and so on. So I go there eventually too. I bring it all the way back in, uh, in chapter five. So one semiology, Marxist literary theory, echo, psychoanalysis, and finally, back to Peirce. In my view, there's, there can be some reconciliation, mostly via Helmslow. I won't talk about that today. But in the view of today's Perseans, there can be no reconciliation. They want to popularize semiotics, first of all. They've decided that in order to do this, they need to sever the, sever the connection with 60s semiology because of its connection with Marxism and psychoanalysis, and therefore, no re reconciliation can be found. And they, they argue, and I'll get back to this later, they argue that there's a flaw in the semiological approach having to do with the binarism of the Saussurean model and having to do with its exclusive interest in language. They say this is a flaw that can't be overcome. And that Peirce gives a solution because with Peirce's sign types, we get back to the body. So we get back to this. Anyway, I pose a, the whole dissertation is about posing a solution, a synthesis basically between the two, using Helmslev to specify the semiological model and show how the triadic purse and the dyadic saucier actually can be combined. Which requires echo, actually, because echo already posed this solution. 
I'm not going to get into that. It's really complicated. <laughs> I just want you to see the picture, and I want you to see where semiology fits in, and for you to know that my whole interest isn't exclusively with semiology and with this radicalized solipsism or whatever you want to call it. But you can only get here if you start from, if you start from here. That's the, that's the and you have to have this proper beginning, I think. Today we'll talk about, though, briefly in eight slides, Foucault, Derrida, Deleuze and Guattari, and then Lacan, Chris Deva Zizek as the psychoanalysts at the very end. It's not just their pessimism, though, which is just sort of uh, indispensable. I believe this, the pessimism itself is indispensable, but it's also the fact why semiology is important today and why we can't just erase it from the history of semiotics is because they also, I think, directly anticipated the paradigm shift. And when I say paradigm shift right now, I mean specifically the technological inf information communicational technologies, which is sweeping the globe <coughs> today sort of culminating. And this is indeed the most pressing question. If semiotics can give us an answer or give us some pragmatic tools uh, to deal with the transition, then it has nothing for us. It really is semiology that gives us the tools, in my view. Controversial view, but this is what I'm maintaining anyway. And you can see from the text of semiology, the most important ones, indeed, it's the case. They saw this coming, if you will. I mean, I have a narrow argument. I guess there are two arguments today. The narrow argument is that, well, in the text of semiology, we can see some premonition of a technological paradigm shift upon us. The broader argument is more complicated, but also crucial. That this paradigm shift is not so easily defined. It cannot be reduced to some kind of transformation at the level of communication technologies but it's rather some kind of profound shift at the level of the order of representation, sort of cognitive, I guess. And I hesitate to say a cognitive evolutionary shift underway, which probably has been underway for a very long time, but it's reaching some kind of culmination now. And that's this, this paradigm shift in the order of representation is merely reflected at the level of communication technology. And this indeed is the argument that's in semiology because you can read their, their texts in a number of ways. Actually, the shift itself is manifest not just at the level of technology, but in other vectors of acceleration as well, to borrow some descriptive language from, from Zizek. He talks about a sort of three-part three acceleration, acceleration of the level of ecology, obviously, climate change and extreme weather events, and then acceleration at the level of bioengineering, equally important, beginning with the sequencing of genomes, but happening most profoundly today in certain societies where the sort of in, in vitro uh, genetic modification of fetuses is already commonplace. And then finally at the level of communication technology. He says these, these three, even if you're a skeptic about one of the three, this coincidence of the three vectors of acceleration presents a sort of inarguable paradigm shift, I guess. And so the paradigm shift itself is not reducible to any, any three, any one of the three. But it is rather a general rupture at the, in the order of representation, as Foucault will call it. And this, well, this coincidence of vectors of acceleration you could say, as, as Barthes says here, it presents a certain kind of demand for semiology. Because as I said, if, if semiology can't give us some, both of, ident can't identify this, couldn't have predicted this, and can't give us tools, pragmatic tools for adaptation to the paradigm shift, then it has nothing for us. Uh, but, you will be the judge, you know. On the one, I mean, whether the semiologists predicted a big shift is inarguable because they were all writing about it. And I'll make that very clear with my quotes here, especially in books like *Elements of Semiology*, 
grammatology and the order of things, which I'll talk about next. You can see that this talk of a big shift underway are coming very soon, and it's sort of dark overtones of pessimism about transformation. It's very clear. What it was about, what they were talking about, is not as, not as concrete. Many people will, reduce, will simply say they're talking about Soviet communism, mostly, or a conflict between Western powers and, and the Soviet Union. I think it's not quite that. You be the judge from the quotes, whether you think this is a, a reasonable argument. Because not everyone agrees with my view. I'm not the first person to have painted the picture this way, to read semiology this way. And many critics, well-informed critics, will say, no, no, no. The semiologists were very pessimistic, yes, but they weren't talking about information technology, no. For example, this Sean Burke is from Edinburgh, a well-known literary critic. We won't come back to it. I only give you this quote because he uses some of the very same vocabulary, which I use to describe them, but he disagrees. When he says that semiology is taken to be uncannily prescient of these developments, almost as though the mysterious Foucauldian claim that the ground is once more shifting, uh, stirring beneath our feet, was referring to this technological paradigm shift. Advocates of the digital revolution envisage that its influence on intellectual culture will be comparable to the shifts from speech to writing. And then he continues to say yes, but they're very wrong about this. There's no way that Foucault was talking about this. And Foucault called it a, called this paradigm shift a, a rupture in the order of representation. And in this quote, he is talking specifically about Foucault, as you can see. So that's where we start. Yes. In Foucault, at least, the paradigm shift could not be located in specific technologies, but would have rather had to do with a transdisciplinary and international rupture in the order of representation. And it's good to start with Foucault, uh, because he speaks most concretely about what this order may be. We can't speak of a paradigm shift without talking about what the previous paradigm actually was. What did it consist of? And Foucault speaks most, most clearly about this. It also has to be pointed out at this stage, well, Foucault was not exactly a semiologist. As you know, I don't know how familiar you are with Michel Foucault. This is one of his earliest works, his greatest work, I think. But uh, he openly distanced distanced himself from semiology. He even used the word semiotics and semiology as like a broad term for that which he didn't like in theory. And also he was an anti-Marxist, or I mean he wasn't, you know, he was there at the time. And at that time in Paris there were the Althusserians. Althusser was a major, Louis Althusser was a major popular Marxist at the time who had kind of reworked Marxist theory. Change, if you ask me, changed it fundamentally. Even, but, and so he was heavily influencing Lacan and Chris Deva, for example. But Foucault didn't like Althusser. Foucault wanted to go his own way. Anyway, you can use these facts as a reason to distance him from those, from Chris Deva and Lacan, for example. I would rather uh, ignore such petty differences, because my whole goal is to actually seek a broader synthesis, as I've told you in my dissertation. A synthesis which would accommodate all the poles, all five, the coordinates of, of semiotics. And, but even more reasonably, I think if you read, if you actually read the order of things, you see that it's almost identical. I mean, the basic arguments are like identical with Derrida, and especially with grammatology. These books like mirror each other almost exactly, and they're very, they're talking about some very semiotic problems, a shift in the order of representation, in a. If you want to be generous, if you want to be charitable to semiotics, you can read them all as semioticians, basically. But anyway, I do this, I do this against the grain, because most people don't do this. I can talk about the structure of the book briefly, because as I said, uh, Foucault talks the most concretely about what this order of representation is. And he does so on the basis of a kind of uh, a controversial uh, historical periodization, if you will, which is also very Marxist. Anyway, he gives us a historical periodization. Oops. So I wrote about his book in my master's thesis. 
Actually, I don't talk about Foucault here. But this diagram, this beautiful diagram is from my master's thesis. So, medieval at the lower level, Renaissance, classical, modern. So medieval is like 15th century and before in this type of typology. Renaissance is like 16th in there. Classical is 17th, 18th. And modern is 19th. And the premise, the premise of the book is really, after, here we are, you know, more or less here, and then beyond this threshold in the postmodern episteme, as he called, there's a fundamental break in the order of representation. After which point, I guess, like, these spiral diagrams come from Henry Bergson. They're also popularized in, uh, uh, in Toulouse and Guattari. At, um, and in Yeats, W.B. Yeats, the poet. Anyway, in these diagrams, there's, there's like a flip. They say, they say that eventually, it doesn't just keep widening. There's a flip, and this constitutes the rupture in the order of representation. But the logic of the diagram is that the relationship between the sign and what it represents becomes wider and wider. And the way that he expl explicates this is by postulating certain what, a disciplinary division between life, labor, and language. And these diagrams come from his book. They're very, they're just, you know, very complicated. <laughs> I didn't even address these diagrams in my master's thesis, but they're very interesting. So in each, uh, at each level of the spiral, which is a historical period, he divides each level into uh, this is language, that general grammar. This is life or biology. And this is labor or economics, I guess. So each period has its own kind of order of representation that can be understood to be, to be common to each of these different domains. Biology, linguistics, and economics. They're all operating kind of according to the same order. And he divides the analysis of each of the disciplines within the order within the epistem according to these categories. And yields all this stuff. It's so complicated, I don't even understand it. But I understand the basic logic. And so the labor, the labor division makes it the clearest. We start here. The way that the sign, the relationship of the sign to what it represents gets wider and wider in the field of labor makes it clearest. So I'll explain that. In medieval, we have precious metals as currency, yes, with no, um, no like stamp or any kind of drawing on the precious metal. And then, sort of, getting a bit later, they start to imprint on the precious metals like a designation, a symbolic designation, which will fix the price of, will fix the value, if you will, of the piece of metal, regardless of its location. And regardless of fluctuations in the actual value of the metal, because of it, there's a symbolic imprint. Later on, I guess probably more like here, I'm not sure exactly where, we get paper money, right? So it's still a physical object. It has inscriptions, but the paper itself has no intrinsic value. Right? So there's an even wider gap between the material of the representation and that ob its object, I guess, what it's attempting to represent, an intrinsic value in the modern episteme and final. We get, or I guess a bit later, we get uh, debit cards, credit cards, virtual money. And when I wrote the master's thesis that ended there, the analysis ended there, of course, something very interesting could be said about Bitcoin, about blockchain, about digital currencies, so on. He likes to quote Arto. If confusion is the sign of the times, I see at the root of this confusion a rupture between things and words, between things and the ideas and signs that are the representation. But the analysis extends to linguistics and biology as well. I think you already know enough about Saussure, for example, to see how modern linguistics embraces a similar rupture between the sign and what it represents. In the Saussurean sign, there is no referent that just analyzes the system of language synchronically. 
the question, so Artaud's quote makes it seem like the, the rupture itself in the order of representation uh, is caused by this gap, this widening gap. As if the sort of source of our problems were the fact of this rupture. Foucault's argument is a bit more complicated. Because it may be that it may be that the paradigm shift we're living through and the sort of what we the hoped for future will be one in which an order of representation bound by a referent itself is overturned. And this is this this order of representation which obeys a notion of truth grounded in presence. It relies on the fact that we can say this is a cup and ver by virtue of some kind of indexical reference, by virtue of the cup's presence, we can say the statement is indeed true. So, in Foucault's, the way that Foucault paints it, this regime of truth is coming to an end. What Artaud says is that this is part of the problem. However, the argument of the semiologists seems to be that the future revolution depends on overturning this system of representation itself. That is a system which relies on a notion of truth grounded in presence. And I believe in some respect this is true. And actually that, that the, the work of semiotics is indeed to overthrow this logocentric matrix of representation. And logocentrism is an important word. And we'll talk about it more. Uh, in terms of Derrida, but just to just to wrap up, uh, about his method, which is the archaeological method of Foucault, in which he reveals this order of representation and its transformation over time, and divides the analysis into three disciplinary groups, that is life, labor, and language, Foucault says, the first thing that we observe is that analysis of wealth or labor obeys the same configuration as natural history, uh, life, and general grammar, language. The theory of value makes it possible, in fact, to explain how objects can be introduced into the system of exchanges. So. This theory, theory of value, the order of representation and the theory of value and the logocentric matrix are all sort of one. And then uh, this was the quote to which Burke was referring, about which he says Foucault was obviously not talking about information technology. In attempting to uncover the deepest strata of Western culture, I am restoring to our silent and apparently immobile soil its rifts, its instability, its flaws, and it is the same ground that is once more stirring under our feet. So if this rift, if this rupture has to do with the arrival of a time in which truth is no longer guaranteed by presence and in which the relationship between the sign and what it represents is broken. The question I pose to you is, the, the question I pose to you is, do you find it persuasive that what they're talking about, this time that they were talking about, refers to the arrival of information technology? This is the, this is the thought that I'm trying to give here, is that this pattern, historical trend, which Foucault was talking about, culminates in, indeed in, in information technology. I think the logic of the argument is, is clear enough, but I want to be sure that you follow me up to this point. How digital information technology makes possible a regime of truth which no longer relies upon presence. Right. It's clear, right? Okay. Hmm? Yes. So 
I think the argument is clear. The question is whether this moment of arrival is something to be feared or to be resisted. Is it the Coleman, is it the ultimate expression of the order of representation or is it its overthrow? Right. The semiologists want to overthrow the order. So is information technology the overthrow? Or is it rather the, the old matrix just magnified? The argument, actually my argument is that it is indeed both. It can't be one or the other, but we proceed. So another word, so Foucault calls the order of representation. This order, the regime of truth that relies upon presence. Another word for this order is the more classic one you may have heard of, logocentrism. Yes. And this comes from Derrida. Foucault didn't actually use the word logocentrism, uh, despite his interest in history of madness and history of sexuality, and, and the way in which these are both like forms, forms of logocentrism, the classification of people according to mental illness or or according to gender uh, heteronormativity, if you will. You can view both of these social struggles as just offshoots of the critique of logocentrism, which is a more basic kind of, kind of oppression, I guess. It's already tricky to call it that, but... So, the concept of logocentrism is, cru the logocentrism is crucial in semiology, but widely misunderstood. And I go to great lengths in my dissertation to kind of disambiguate the notion of logocentrism because I mentioned already that semiology is discredited uh, by contemporary semiotics for a number of reasons, particularly for its preoccupation with language, spoken language. They say a number of things about this. They say that this preoccupation with language uh, diminishes the importance of uh, non-linguistic signs. Uh, gestures, uh, or even pic pictographic signs, or more importantly, non-human signs. Yeah? And um, so they can call it anthropocentric. They call sem semiology anthropocentric, which is ridiculous. <laughs> but uh, they also call it logocentric, because they think that logocentrism means a, an exclusive interest in verbal language at the expense of other regimes of science. Right? And we can say, we can admit that semiology is indeed not exclusively preoccupied with verbal language, but indeed prioritizes the study of verbal language. But does this mean that it's logocentric? No. Right. That's the glottocentrism is the technical term for the exclusive interest in verbal language at the expense of other ways of communicating. Definition of logocentrism, definition of logocentrism is a little more complicated. Here it's good to keep in mind the Saucerian model of the sign, signifier signified. Signifier being, for example, the word, the written word, or the sound. And the signified being that concept. You can say the concept in the mind of the, of the receiver or the concept in the mind of the speaker. And here's a quote from my dissertation where I say logocentrism is the belief that the signified uh, concept in the mind of whoever has a natural bond with the referent and that while different signifiers are used in different languages, the signifieds to which these signifiers are correlated are the same for everyone across all cultures. So obviously signifiers are different in different languages, right? I'm using English now. Not use, would they be completely different words with no similarity to your Czech words? There may be some similarity, but it'd be coincidental. The view of classical semiology, we're talking about like Aristotle and Augustinus, that's where semi semiology, I guess, started. In their view, they acknowledge the signifiers are different, of course, but in the minds of the speakers and in the listeners, they, they said that it is indeed the same, where our concept of uh, teacup is, is the same. The language has nothing to do with the construction of the concept in our minds, because the concept pre-exists language. This is classical semiology. And so, uh, if it's the same, if the teacup is the same in your mind as it is in my mind, regardless of linguistic construction, we can say that there's a bond between the signified, that is the concept of the cup, and the actual cup, right? 
one follows from the other. So this belief, indeed, that the concept is the same in my mind as it is in yours, irrespective of language, this is logocentrism, right? So the logocentric view is to import a referent, to bring in a, naively bring in a referent, to presume a referent, which is guaranteed, can be guaranteed in a number of different ways. We can say here, sort of indexically guaranteed, but presence, the closest, closest of the cup, is what assures us, what can assure you that what I'm talking about when I say teacup is the same as what you're thinking. It's guaranteed by this regime of truth. Right? A regime which relies on presence, Further, in Derrida, and this is a little more complicated. Now, like I said at the beginning, you know, you're going to get, you're going to understand some things that I say today, but not all. You just have to cling to, to that what you get. But in Derrida, he goes considerably further than Foucault in this project of deconstructing what he called the transcendental signified. But Derrida explains to us how the order of representation is logocentric because of its not because of its exclusive interest in language per se, but because of its exclusive interest in phonological, or that is alphabetic language. Why is this? It's very interesting and it's, far, it's hard to understand. So, uh, understand. So think about alphabetic language. What is alphabetic language? Chinese characters or pictographic language refers, you could say directly, or maybe it refers, it refers to ideas based upon a, a conventional, Maybe in Chinese characters, you can say there's some kind of similarity to the concept that's being referred to. This is not what alphabetic language does. As you know, you're all linguistics in your own right. You're at least polyglots, so you understand language enough to know that alphabetic language functions by reproducing the sounds of speech. Right? That's what the letters of, of words do. They don't actually signify the letters themselves. This is a double articulation, I guess. The letters themselves don't have any contact with, connection with the thoughts, the concepts at all. Rather, they reproduce certain sounds of speech, and then the words themselves, can, they construct a sort of second order connection with the concepts. So, this is all about the voice. Alphabetic language is all about the voice. That's why it's called phonocentrism. Derrida argues that the order of representation is logocentric because of its phonocentric alphabetism, because alphabetic languages rely on a regime of truth grounded by presence in the voice. Here is my teacup. How do you know it's true? Because I'm saying it with my voice, right? Phon you follow me here? Speech, I guess. And so, semiology may very well be logocentric, but only to the extent which it privileges, the extent to which it privileges uh, phonological alphabetic languages. And it's more than, it's even, it's indeed more than that, that Derrida is trying to say, but the only way he knows how to say it that we'll understand is by using these particular examples. And so a, a linguistics, let's say a general, properly general linguistics, is one which would embrace a notion of language that transcends logocentrism by overcoming this dependence on a regime of truth grounded by presence in the voice. And if you can wrap your head around that, you can begin to contemplate what such a semiotics, what such a general, a general linguistics would really be. And this is what Derrida was trying to create. But in, in explaining this bond between logocentrism and alphabets and presence, this quote is useful where he says, the system of language associated with phonetic alphabetic writing is that within which logocentric metaphysics, determining the sense of being as presence, has been produced. Limiting the internal system of language in general by a bad abstraction, it prevents Saussure and the majority of his successors from determining fully and explicitly that which is called the integral and concrete object of linguistics. By linguistics, he means general linguistics. This is related to the Kristeva question. Semiotics part of linguistics or linguistics part of semiotics? Indeed, semiotics is greater than a linguistics grounded in a logocentric alphabetic language. But if we redefine linguistics to include the non-logocentric, then linguistics becomes 
broader than semiotics. So I didn't expect anybody to quite take it that far. Some of you got close. Surprising. So you can conceive all of semiotics as this project for the critique of local centrism. And you can conceive all of the projects of sort of social justice today, or even identity politics, to use the pejorative term, uh, as projects of the critique of logocentrism. And thus, understanding logocentrism makes it possible to unify these like divided struggles. Yes. And that's the importance. This is the real importance of semiotics. If you believe these struggles are important, not everyone does. But there are a number of reasons why uh, uh, deconstruction isn't universally embraced. Uh, part of the re some of the reasons are just these complexities about the difficulty of understanding what logocentrism is and, and so on. Also because he's sometimes he's purposefully misleading. He redefines a lot of basic words. Ooh. How does 45 minutes slip away? I don't know. We have more time. That's fine. Uh, it, not only does he redefine language and, and so on uh, in these ways, these difficult ways, but he also redefines writing. Because one of the ways he describes the paradigm shift is by saying that it is a time when writing replaces speech as the primary mode of human communication, which kind of seems strange to us. We think about today, we think write, writing has replaced speech. That's odd. How many of us actually sit down and write? Not really. We're doing something else. We can see how speech kind of slips away as the main mode of communication, but writing? But obviously, he means something different by writing. He's talking about a different mode of communication, which gradually uh, displaces speech. And this arrival of writing has been a long process, basically since the arrival of alphabets. And so this is a process, this widening gyre of representation. It's been a process that's been ongoing for a long time. And to characterize what's happening today as the replacement of speech by writing is weird because no one writes anymore. But again, in order to interpret Derrida as having predicted the paradigm shift, we have to read him more charitably than that and understand he meant something different by writing. Writing will designate in grammatology not only the physical gestures of literal pictographic or ideographic inscription, but also the totality of what makes it possible, whether it is literal or not, and even if what it distributes in space is alien to the order of the voice. Right. Right. So any mode of communication that doesn't require presence grounded in the voice is apparently writing. So if we look at the WhatsApp interface, for example, obviously writing is still important. The voice even is still important. It's a keyboard for writing, alphabetism. I think emojis are somewhat overplayed in semiotic analysis. They're not that important. They have the option to do voice recording. Whoever does that? No one. It seems a bit old-fashioned now, doesn't it? But what is the main, what is the gold standard of communication today? Well, we know it's actually link, I, well, okay, I think, that it's link and photo sharing is actually the gold standard of communication. That's how you establish a real bond with someone. For example, you're traveling, you want your friends to see what you're doing. What do you do? Take a photo, you send that to them. But if we can think of writing as including such various modes of communication as link sharing, photo and, and link sharing, then we can see how writing is beginning to displace speech as the primary mode of communication. But so by writing, what he really means is texting. That's what I say. Of course, in 67, he wasn't doing a lot of texting. But you know, 67 feels like a long time ago to us, but really they, it wasn't that long ago. And they had many of the basic technologies that we have. So to give them credit for being shrewd enough to know what was coming, it's not, it doesn't require, they were intelligent people. They had the basic technologies upon which to make such inferences is that the, is that the writing, the writing to come, the new mode of communication characteristic of the paradigm shift was, like, was related to the development of practical methods of information retrieval 
which extend the possibilities of the message of writing vastly and go hand in hand with the extension of phonography, uh, which make writing function without the presence of the speaking subject. The main feature of the new writing is this. It's any kind of communication that doesn't rely on the presence of the speaking subject. You can see how when a regime of truth that doesn't rely on presence guaranteed by the voice implies the possible disappearance of the referent, and how this is a crisis of representation, which has been forecast for a very long time, but which we see is a culminating now. I mean, I don't want to use cheap examples, but bots, for example. There's bots online. That's the best example. But there are numerous, plenty of other ways, plenty of other examples to point to. Uh, but again, this is one reason why Derrida isn't actually all that popular, is because he said things like, the paradigm shift is the time when writing replaces speech, because today we say, that when writing replaces speech, we barely do any writing at all, isn't it something quite different? So a different word probably would have been better, not writing. And, uh, so this is, leads me to the second I have to speed up a little bit or we're going to run out of time. We won't be able to talk about your questions. But so there are some other semiologists, though, who came well after Derrida, who uh, in some ways weren't as rigorous as Derrida, but who also perceived the actual characteristics of the new mode of communication, I think, much more clearly and described it much more clearly. This may be the reason for their ascendance, uh, for the reason why Deleuze and Guattari are now, I think, still to this day, the most highly cited authors of, uh, in social science, period, bar none. It's bizarre, though, because if you look at their books, uh, Capitalism, Schizophrenia, which is two books, Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus, and these are very difficult books, uh, <laughs> uh, to say the least. And, what they're really known for, Deleuze and Guattari, is their textual experimentation. So it gives the text a real density, and, and it's good luck trying to find practical applications of their books. You know, if there are any books of semiotics for which there is no, like, you know, mom's going to ask you, what are you going to do with that degree? You know, you're not going to do anything with Deleuze and Guattari, which is weird why they're so popular. Anyway, they are, and it may be for that, this very reason is their non-instrumentalizability, their unwillingness to compromise, I don't know, because they're the most explicitly radicalized as well. Anyway, you should know about them one way or the other, even if you don't sympathize with this kind of radicalism or you don't like that kind of writing, writing which is not clear, writing which takes you on some kind of wild chase and is free to a wide variety of interpretations. Some people like it, some people don't. It all depends on what you want to do. Yes. Anyway. So they also described themselves as being against deconstruction. And this was just the attitude of the Parisians, though. They were all in the same place, and they're all writing about the same thing, and they're all pretty popular, too, so they're egomaniacs. They just tear each other down. You know, Foucault, Lacan, Althusser, Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, actually, they were students. Uh, Deleuze was a student of Foucault, and Foucault wrote the famous introduction to Antietas. Anyway, they take words right out of Derrida's mouth, though, even though they say they don't like deconstruction. In some way, in some respects, they improve on Derrida. So here in this first quote, they summarize this view from Derrida that I just got done explaining how the logocentric view uh, implies a use of language in general according to which graphism becomes aligned on the voice, but also overcodes it and induces a fictitious voice from on high that functions as a signifier. I guess this fictitious voice is something like the, the general inter instrumental logic of the order of representation. And they write that the paradigm shift relies on a graphic system that is independent of the voice, a system that is not aligned on the voice and not subordinate to it, but connected to it, coordinated in an organization that is radiating, as it were, and multidimensional. So in these last words, they begin to approximate like what I would call the features, features of the new communication regime in which we notice, I think, we notice the, like, the old parameters of identity construction collapsing before our eyes. I think. 
particularly the distances of time and space. You know, so because we can no longer we can no longer say the student was present or the student was absent. If you're online, if you're watching my lecture online right now, which no one is right now, but nevertheless, say I've got a group in front of me, but then there are some students on Zoom also. Can I say that these students were present and they were absent? No. There may have been a time when you could say that. Because of the fidelity of the interface now, there's no, there's no longer any sense in grounding our, our regime of truth in such a, such a naive way. And these, these, uh, the more and more we rely on these styles of communication, the more and more we notice these time distortions and distortions of subject and object and self and other, which are real. And so what the argument from semiology is that so technology isn't creating these distortions. Rather, the old order of representation created these fictitious constructs before. And what technology is showing us is that the identity and self-construction, like the sense of self grounded in presence, is just a hallucination created by, well, created by language. Yes. And all the technology, all this technology is showing us is what was always the case. This is a radical argument. That's the basics. That's it. So the goal would be to further to dis to really push it. Like, and so, the training ground of this non-identification, which happens as the barriers between self and other and temporal linearity begin to collapse, uh, in technology, the original training grounds of this non-identification were language games. And that's why some may say, in Deleuze, a text of Deleuze and Guattari, there's so much, uh, it's basically randomization. There are logical arguments, but they also rearrange their own text and force the reader to put it back together. And they anticipate that you create new meanings in the process. And they rely on surrealist word games of replacement and other things, which we'll talk about. If you take my course next semester, we're going to talk a lot about this stuff. But anyway, so this was training and dream, interpreta dream interpretation too. These textual games were meant to train you, to prepare you for what was coming inevitably as a result of the technology. And that's why these texts are so weird. But beyond their nice redefinitions of uh, basic Derridean concepts, they also solved the problem of Derrida's uh, formulation of writing replacing speech. It's not writing that replaces speech. It's rather something else, which more closely approximates what we're experiencing now. And they were very smart in choosing the word, word recording. Recording replaces speech. Because you can see how writing was a way of recording. Writing was the classic way of recording. But we have much more advanced techniques now. And when we're sharing things online, we're sharing more advanced ways of recording. We record I don't know, the concert that we're at, or the festival or whatever with our phones. And then we share them with the friends. So this, replaces, this replaces speech as a fundamental uh, mode of communication. And we can see how this is the case. This is happening now. So they redefine, if they're writing as replacing speech, they also say that the subject, in the new paradigm shift, the subject is reduced to the recording surface. So subject, self and other, let's say. It's no longer so simple. And I'm the speaker and you are the one on the receiver. You're on the other end of the camera, on the other side. Rather, the subjectivity is constituted on the surface. And the surface being the screen, I think. Again, they were writing this in the 70s, early 70s. So they knew computers were on the horizon, but film, film was there. And they could see where it was going because of, they could witness the rate of acceleration already taking place. And all you have to do is logically extrapolate from there. And you can do that today. Just ask yourself. Uh, if, so think about the cell phone that you had 10 years ago. I think I said this at the Seminole phone last time, but whoever was here. But ask yourself what kind of phone you had 10 years ago. And tell yourself that, OK, the rate of change is going to be exactly proportional between that 10 years ago and now. 20, 30, you're going to have a phone that was that degree more events, what would that even mean? This is what we're talking about here. But it's more likely that it'll be double, triple. And so they did the same thing. They had, they're rational people. They knew what was coming. That's my point. Uh, subject can be discerned on the recording surface. It's a strange subject, though. 
with no fixed identity. Uh, I'm running out of time, but so I'll skip to some of my examples. The, the reason they were talking about recording in anti-Oedipus is because they were psychoanalysts. They were critics of Lacan. They wanted to remove the family structure from psychoanalysis. Uh, psychoanalysis. If you think of Freud, you, you think there's the analyst, there's the patient on the bed, and they're talking to each other. And they, they play a role where the analyst is like the father figure, and the, uh, the patient is like the, whatever, the troubled son or daughter. And Deleuze and Guattari didn't like this way that the structure of analysis reproduced the paternalistic family structure. And there are all these theoretical acrobatics, how they deconstruct psychoanalysis where, psychoanalysis, where it's no longer all about repression, trauma created by the father, your bad relationship with your mother, and all that. They took a lot from psychoanalysis from the con, but they removed a lot also. One interesting addition they made, and this is about recording, is that they found that uh, the best way to physically critique psychoanalysis was to go into the analysis session, but to bring a tape recorder and to pull it out, middle of the session, put it down on the table, hit record, and see what the analyst, how the analyst responds. Long story short, they found that it was unacceptable. The analysts wouldn't take it. Uh, it changed. Being recorded changed the attitude of the analyst. It also changed the attitude of the, of the listener, of the patient. In, his own pract in Guattar Guattari's own psychoanalytic practice, he actually found that it was uh, a good way to overcome pauses, awkward pauses and breaks in the session with the patient. If the patient ran out of things to say or became uncomfortable, he would take out the recorder and pr press record, and he found that that would restart the session. So it could, do, could work both ways. When I tell you that this session is being recorded, it changes, your, it changes what you may say in the question-answer question period. Needless to say, it changes my own orientation to you. These things are fairly obvious. But when we say that we live in a time in which recording replaces speech as the primary mode of communication, and we, know, we can see what this means, as long as it includes all of the functions of the, of the smartphone. But clearly, it's no protection against bad behavior being recorded. We would think that it might be some kind of guarantee. And Deleuze and Guattari would say when they insist on recording their sessions, they would apologize and say, recording is merely a matter of creating a memory for man, one that is collective. Yes, but it's clear that it's not so benign is all that. To say that recording has no bad effects, or that we should embrace a world in which everything is recorded, is to have a somewhat naive orientation to the paradigm shift. Yes, especially when it comes to surveillance. It also has more concrete examples. For example, I don't know if you read the news story about this Astro World conference with uh, Travis, Travis Scott. There's some concert in the United States that went crazy and a bunch of people died. But there's this famous image now, now famous. It's like there's, a, there's like a stampede in the front, and a bunch of people are dying in the front. And meanwhile, everyone's recording the session. I like the vortex. I think it's compelling. It's a compelling image. Is the technology of the paradigm shift, the, are these the tools of our emancipation from the logocentric matrix? Or do they merely? repeat and amplify the structures of domination. Uh, it remains up to you to uh, answer for yourself this question. And as I said, they're big critics. Deleuze and Guattari were big critics of psychoanalysis. One of their problems, I think, problems with Deleuze and Guattari, and perhaps one of the reasons why they remain so popular while Lacan and Foucault and Derrida seem to be on the decline, is because they're quite a bit more playful in their language, and I think they were more optimistic, actually. Uh, they felt that they could simply get rid of trauma, the notion of trauma even, and the family structure from psychoanalysis, and that if the, perhaps if they just ignore the family structure, it will just go away, that you can transcend familial repression the Oedipus complex, as they called it. That's hence the name of the book, Anti-Oedipus. 
that it would go away just by ignoring it. But I stand by the enduring value of Lacanian psychoanalysis. And look, as you probably have heard before, psychoanalysis is widely discredited for a number of reasons. It's discredited by the mainstream psychiatry uh, for a number of reasons, again. But the, I mean, the main reason, though, rest assured, is what the goal of psychiatry is to help patients overcome the trauma and integrate into society. But the goal of psychoanalysis is the contrary. The goal of psychoanalysis was for the patient to identify the trauma, to identify with the trauma, and then to weaponize the trauma against society. <laughs> so fundamentally different goals here. Right? Some semiotics is non-instrumentalizable. Semiotics will not help you find your place in society. That was not the point. From this view, there are many different semiotics, but from the view of sem semiology, that was it. Uh, anyway, for that reason, the radicalism of Lacan remains very valuable, and I have to rush through this bit. One of you had a very nice answer uh, about the first question, but which brought up the uh, issue of the uh, imaginary and the symbolic as it compares with Kristeva's formulation. It's Zdenyek? Zdenyek Yoko? That was you, okay. That was nice. You compared the imaginary and the symbolic with the Kristeva's semiotic. And this is the real and the thetic. Anyway, these are modes of identification. Uh, the, point, the point I'm trying to make here, just to rush to the end, is that instead of ignoring the laws of the old order of, of representation, uh, these laws don't simply disappear if we close our eyes. In fact, they have to be deconstructed by force. And uh, that includes the family structure in psychoanalysis, for example. Uh, but some, Lacan describes two of these laws as the imaginary and the symbolic. Just to be very brief, uh, the imaginary identification is identification with uh, a role model, for example, or someone we want to appear like. We think of ourselves in the most flattering, flattering possible light. And for example, uh, sometimes when I'm at the gym listening to music, or running, especially when I'm running, for example, and listening to music, I imagine that I'm the singer on the stage and everyone is watching me. This is imaginary identification. And Lacan's point is that this kind of fantasy, we call it fantasy, is rather the norm and that it can come to describe all of, almost all of our experience in life. Other one's symbolic identification, and that has to do with the oppressor. The symbolic big other may be your employer, it may be your university professor, or whoever you like. And we, don't, we identify with them not by pretending that we're them, but by structuring our own unconscious uh, expressions in terms and context of them. Anyway, so these are, those are the two modes of identification. But more broadly speaking, the, ident the imaginary in Lacan, and particularly in Kristeva, who calls it the semiotic, uh, is constituted by a sense and affect and emotion, movement, gesture. All these things show up in language but are more prominent in physical expressivity. And she would correlate them with the unconscious, whereas the symbolic is more concretely expressed in, especially in formal languages, but also in just normal verbal languages with concrete denotations, definite definitions, and strict concepts, and so on and so on. There's this interactivity there. The whole problematic arises about whether we can really class the unconscious in this fashion. And as Denik, you raised this problem. Or anyway, I would pose the question to you regarding this uh, difference between Kristeva and Lacan's approach here, and which one's which. Uh, anyway, just to jump to the end, I wanted to conclude by reminding that, uh, or by pointing to the fact that, well, this order of representation, in principle, can never be overcome. It's not something from which one can escape. This was the Lacanian idea. The notion of escape is naive, thus the reason why trauma is not something to be avoided or overcome, but rather embraced, identified with, and weaponized. Because transcendence can't be conceived of within the order. And this is the basic pessimism of semiology. The order is such that even the 
conceptualization of transcendence only puts you deeper into the prison, I guess, the logocentric prison. Yes. But, and so the subject is always fastened, pinned to a signifier which represents him for the other, and through this pinning, he is loaded with a symbolic mandate. He is given a place in the intersubjective network of symbolic relations. Just to call attention to the ubiquity of symbolic and imaginary identification today, especially in the paradigm shift, I would ask you the next time that you're having a WhatsApp call or maybe a Facebook camera talk call or a Zoom, even a Zoom, you know the little screen, the selfie view, which pops up in the corner. When you're on your call, what are you watching? You're watching yourself. And thus identifying with the subjective viewpoint of the other. This is the basic logic that Lacan is pointing to and which um, proves to us that the technologies of the paradigm shift, while perhaps presenting the best tools of our emancipation, also uh, reflect back to us the basic structures of repression that characterize the old order of representation. And I like Chris Deva the most. I just want to end with that. And I didn't talk much about Chris Deva today. I gave you her text, not just because of its difficulty, uh, but also because she's my favorite. Because uh, while her formulation of the semiotic, that is the imaginary, may seem a bit romantic. It may seem a bit romantic because it seems like in Kristeva there's a possibility of overcoming symbolic repression and breaking out of the representational matrix and getting back to the body. And this is kind of an unsemiotic viewpoint. Uh, it's important to understand all this talk about embodiment and of sign types which can somehow mark for us what icons or indexes or whatever, whatever you got can somehow classify for us sense and affect and movement and emotion. Yes, simply by labeling them, we can recuperate them out from under language. Yes, this is a very romantic idea. And this is not semiotic, okay. much as they might want to convince you that it is. And so in Kristeva, that's kind of there, like that romanticism. But at the same time, she is the most pessimistic and the most severe. And I like her severity. Even from her, early, even from her PhD dissertation called uh, Revolution in Poetic Language, the severity is already quite pronounced. And I'll just read this as my favorite quote from Kristeva about the, I mean, it's about what you might call the goal of the psychoanalytic process, the goal of analysis, but we can also call it the goal. I would also call it the goal of semiotics. Uh, going through this, uh, going through the experience of this crucible exposes the subjects to impossible dangers, relinquishing his identity in rhythm, dissolving the buffer of reality in a mobile discontinuity, leaving the shelter of the family, the state or religion, the commotion the practice creates spares nothing. It destroys all constancy to produce another and then destroys that one as well. This is why I love Christina. because of the unrelenting pessimism. And it's this relentlessness, I think, which is so admirable about these semiologists. Whether they are talking about information technology remains up to you to decide. I have a last quote, which I compiled in my master's thesis about the panopticon, which I think proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, indeed, when they talk about paradigm shift, they were talking about technology. But I don't know, how much time do we have? Okay. Uh, yes. So I talked about this very question in my master's thesis. And that's where I wrote about Foucault. And I even had a section in the thesis about the, the question of whether the semiologists were talking about information technology when they talked about the paradigm shift. It's clear that they anticipated a dis disintegration of classic subjectivity. It's clear that they saw that this would lead to I don't know, tumultuous social change. Uh, 
it was not clear where they located this change. It was not clear that they anticipated social media or surveillance, or let's just say recording. And so in order to argue, in order to bring home my argument that indeed that was what they were talking about, I took all, I read all of what Foucault wrote about the Panopticon and I recompressed it into a new citation. For those of you who don't know, the Panopticon was a fictional or hypothetical prison designed by Jeremy Bentham in the 18th century. He was a British philosopher. And it was meant to make, uh, prisons, uh, make prisons easier to facilitate and less expensive by creating a circular prison with a single watchtower in the center. And there's only one layer, uh, layer of prison cells. And on the inside of the prison cells, there were all glass windows. And so th there was one guard in the guard tower. And the guard could see into any one of the prison cells uh, at any time but the prisoners could not see into the guard tower. So while in principle you could be being watched at any time, um, most of the time the guard's not watching you because there's not enough time. I mean, he can't be looking everywhere at once, but nevertheless the prisoners behave as though they're being surveilled at all times, right? So it's very efficient and it, it leads to this regime of self-surveillance and self-censorship, which I think is very apropos of the the current regime of recording that we live in right now, where we have to assume everything on our screen, our browsing history, for example, everything is being recorded. And thus, even though probably no one will ever review this material, nevertheless, we have to behave as though they're going to. So, was Foucault with the Panopticon, he brings this up in his book about real prisons. Right? It's a history of, of physical prisons and an interrogation of the uh, of, uh, of incarceration uh, throughout history. It's another historical approach. So I chose these uh, samples. He writes, the panopticon begins with a strict spatial partitioning. It is a segmented, immobile, frozen space where inspection functions ceaselessly. This surveillance is based on a system of permanent registration, constantly centralized. All events are recorded in which an uninterrupted work of writing links the center and the periphery, in which each individual is constantly located, and whose power has its principle in a certain concerted distribution of bodies, surfaces, lights, gazes. The panoptic schema was destined to spread throughout the social body, to increase production, to develop the economy, spread education, to increase and multiply. So if you take these quotes, out of context and squish them together in the way that I did, then it seems, probably, yeah, it seems like he was talking about social media, huh? right? Screens, lights, and gazes, uninterrupted work of writing linking the center and the periphery. That's the really interesting one. How could that apply to physical prison? I'm not sure, but I have to confess that there are plenty of other uh, quotes from the same section of the book, which are clearly not about social media, they're about something else. So I did a bit of, uh, uh, I took a bit of poetic license with this uh, in order to prove my own point. One may say that this is over-interpretation, or that this is dishonest, mis misreading of Foucault's text. But I will remind that person that this is exactly what the semiologists asked us to do right, in, in their exercise. In the training ground of semi, which is, which is writing, a style of writing which involves reorganization. The whole, which is based on the idea of Barthes called the death of the author, in which the meaning of the text cannot be guaranteed by its authorial, by its, by its origin. The author doesn't get to decide what he meant, right? This is part of it. This is related to the paradigm shift as well, and the end of the order of representation. So, but you can read Foucault in a number of different lights, in the same way you can read the rest of semiology in whatever light you like. You can read it in a pessimistic light, in which our obligation is to resist and overthrow this new regime of surveillance that is online life. Or you can read them as saying, well, this is it, like this is the promised future in which we are freed from the logocentric bond to our physical identities, freed to roam, freed to redefine ourselves in whatever way we like. 
So while I really like, I'm very attracted to this tradition of pessimistic, dark uh, analysis, I am forced at this point in my career uh, to also read it in a more optimistic light, uh, which would give us pragmat more pragmatic instructions, which I'll get to in a moment. But I'm, I'm forced to read it in a light or by a light that maybe either we do not yet know which, the reviving flame of the last great fire, or an indication of the dawn, and in which we see the emergence of what may be perhaps the space of contemporary thought. Yes. So, the indication of the dawn, right? That's how we're forced to read it, how I'm forced to read it anyway when I'm writing a project that for a digital humanities program can't be based upon destroying the system. Yes. So these are my conclusions. That pessimism of semiology is necessary, but not sufficient for general semiotics. General semiotics goes beyond semiology. Yes. It involves cognitive science and quantitative methods, computation. And uh, further, well, no turning back the clock. Uh, turning back the clock is the name of a collection of essays by Umberto Eco, actually. And it's about nationalism, uh, mostly, and ethnocentrism, his critique of ethnocentrism. And, and he, he very eloquently talks about the problems of identity politics and the ways that, like, uh, women's rights, uh, environmental politics, and LGBTQ have been uh, commodified by corporate media and used that more or less uh, as a weapon against emancipation. So Echo acknowledges this point, but he says, unfortunately for the critics of the critics of the paradigm shift, there's no putting the genie back in the bottle. And this is an important view, and it's important, but it also applies to uh, cyberspace. Uh, certainly the online life is the panopticon times 10. No one can, can disagree with the observation that telecommunications reflect back to us and magnify all the worst characteristics of humanity. This does not change the fact that it is not only the best, but also the only tool for our emancipation from this logocentric matrix. And I mean, the potentialities of this can't be downplayed, and I find a lot of intellectuals in, in my social circle, trying to do just this, trying to act as though the benefits afforded by communication technology aren't as significant as they are. That it's not important that we can now have meetings with people anywhere in the world at any time. So, can't be naive about that. And these all play into so, I'm really interested in generating pragmatic instructions for the paradigm shift for this digital humanities program. And as a supervisor and um, coordinator in the Department of General Linguistics, developing pragmatic instructions for the paradigm shift. And that's why I have this project, which I decided to call Digital Ideology Critique, with the subtitle of Life Likeness and Personal Autonomy in the Digital Space. It's also a title of a Mary Curry project I just wrote with the help of Ludmila and, and some other project managers and so on. And I, I really like the acronym for this, Lily, Lily Pads, Life Likeness and Personal Autonomy. Anyway, we're interested in, in fostering post-representational or post-logocentric digital space, which involves uh, conceiving the online world as a space of discourse and ideology construction. And I think most practically the idea in, in the online space and in this movement to use quantitative tools, I guess especially the drive for quantificational methods, I guess we see a trend in which the individual subject is as if erased or we want to operationalize all the most basic tasks, including reading, for example. We, wanna, we want an app that will summarize any text for us that, so we don't actually have to read it, right? For example, the Kristeva text. Wouldn't it be convenient? So you just take a cell phone shot, and then you'd have the perfect answer for Tyler. But what I'm saying is that we don't want to operationalize everything. And this is the key. There are some mundane tasks, indeed, which, you know, the digital revolution helps us to operationalize these. And 
we no longer need to waste our time with that. There are some other tasks which we do not want to operationalize. Thus, the goal, first of all, the, one of the goals of the project is to identify the difference. What are the humane tasks which we would rather maximize and prolong? One of them, for example, I think is a classroom, certain classroom settings in which the goal actually rather is to, it's not to streamline and make more efficient the classroom experience, the interaction with the students, but figure out a way to maximize and even to prolong it, right? You now it sounds agonizing, but that is the goal, right? That's the goal. And so, I know, I don't want to find myself in a future in which we decided that, that can be something which the computer takes care of for us. So that's part of the goal. So anyway, we've got a few minutes left, maybe. How much time exactly? semiotics, but if you have projects which are related to any of these goals or are fascinated by any of the topics which have been raised during the lecture, I want you to remember what they are and keep them in mind next semester when you're deciding what courses to take or what to write your thesis about. My courses, uh, my courses so far there's just one next semester, but there will be more in the future, are going to heavily uh, emphasize writing every, every week there will be little writing assignments. And, and one may dread this, but do you know at the, end of the, at the end of your term, you will indeed have to write a thesis. <laughs> so it's better to start writing sooner than later. And you'll find actually that whatever papers you write in your courses, you'll end up cannibalizing those. You'll use them in your thesis, I guarantee it. So it's, it's better to start thinking of every paper and every writing assignment in terms of that final product, even if that final product is something in, I don't know, anthropology or marketing or whatever it is you do. So, and a lot, and it'll be in English too. So if you're, and, and this is presuming you're writing your thesis in English, otherwise I'll be useless to you, completely useless. And we can talk about your questions. We can, we can probably skip the, uh, I was gonna talk more about the course structure, but uh, applied semiotics, which is the course next semester that I'm teaching. But if you wanna know more about applied semiotics, you can just look it up. So everybody chose the um, question one, except for Agnieszka. Yeah. We chose difficult question about Marx. And that's impressive. And um, can you paraphrase your, your So the question was, uh, one problem with Marx is that he focuses on exchange value and disregards use value, according to Kristeva. What is the connection here with psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis and the unconscious? Could you paraphrase the question or could you give us, uh, paraphrase your answer or give us a new thought that you may have had after having heard the lecture? Tell the, tell the others what your answer was. Uh, well, the question was difficult for me. I had to read uh, the first time it several times, to be honest, <laughs> uh, to kind of get behind the, the idea. But, um, like as far as I understood, uh, in the uh, subconscious that uh, Freud describes, there is something behind meaning, something we cannot conceptualize with language. And yeah. there is something Marx only hints on and kind of disregards and doesn't borrow with it or um, the rest of his work, but leaves it like, up to the open, up for the interpretation. And uh, Kristeva draws the connection with Marx on this point. There's something beyond value in the subconscious that cannot be expressed. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting that we can conceive of Marx, the whole works of Marx, as like somewhat anti-Semiotic in this way, depending upon how you choose to look at it. Also notable, so there's this, there's exchange value, which is based on a universal equivalent in which everything we have, the, its value is determined by in terms of this equivalent. The equivalent is money, of course. But he says that there's a more, gen more general equivalent. Money is just a sort of physical realization of this general equivalent that orders the order of representation. Uh, point being, the psychoanalysis is a good way to analyze that which, is, that, that which escapes this equivalent 
And another interesting point to point out is that Kristeva says that the semiotic, that is the real interest of semiotics, is not in the symbolic, that is it's not in the exchange value according to exchange, a closed system of valuation, but rather in this other thing, which escapes signa, escapes uh, quantification, if you will. And that's where the sign activity happens. Looks like you're eager to run Zdeniak, but I uh, hope I'm not pronouncing your name incorrectly. I wanted to also draw attention to your answer here. Uh, and where he, he points out the very thing that I pointed out in my, uh, in my slide about this connection between Lacan and Kristeva. I don't know how he anticipated where I was going with this, but the imaginary and the symbolic can also be conceived as the semiotic and the symbolic. But can you say anything about the relation to Persis triads? First, icon index symbol? Where would they go? One's obvious. Anyone? Ludmila? No. I think that's it. Then he has an answer. I think he does, yeah. yeah. Good. That one's obvious. It's tough to, so I probably icon index symbol, but then how it, so it makes it more complicated. Because index is supposed to be the object, right? Index is supposed to be, how do we determine what an index is? Is by causality? or closeness, proximity, presence. It's by presence, right? And so if we define the index in that way, in the old way, in terms of a referent, we may say that it falls prey to the logocentric fallacy, right? So we have to read purse differently in order for purse to be semiotics at all, right? Although there are those today who want to say that purse is all there is in semiotics and that the, the index is indeed a physical object. My argument is that that's not semiotics. Fortunately, we have some precedents for reading purse differently, so we can use it properly. And in this reading, indeed, it works. I kind of make something like that. But Echo, okay, Umberto Echo, is one of the readers of purse who makes it possible. Anyway, one last thing, one last thing, before you all go, is uh, tonight's, there's more. <laughs> some of you are in the semiotics salon thing, right? It's this. It says seven, six, it's at six. And we're gonna be here in this very room with some of our friends at six. And it's gonna be really good, it's gonna be better than usual. These are real professors who are talking today. And there'll be snacks, so you can come join us if you want, no pressure. There's also the Facebook event. Uh, Ludmila, you wanna say anything for the Now we are already out of time, so just, thank you so much, it was excellent. And uh, we will have the uh, test next week, but I am a little bit that that if any one of you prefers doing the sample chat in English with Taylor, uh, if you like this topic, you can also go for that option. It's optional. So, but uh, if you have one week to decide to do that. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks for your attention.